everyone. Welcome to the Linux Cast. I'm your host today, Tyler. I'm Josh. And I'm um, uh, Steve. Sorry. <laughs> Steve's going to be promoting some stuff hardcore throughout the stream. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the live version, the uh, edited version. Everything will actually be up on Matt's channel. So if you want to wait to watch that for whatever reason or you're watching this afterwards and you'd like to see the edited version because you know it's got timestamps and nice stuff like that in it head on over to matt's channel hopefully it'll be up by the time you're watching this maybe maybe not he's sick so you know give him some headway and uh yeah we're gonna go ahead and get started with today's fun little stream so we've got we're gonna do our normal stuff go through our you know, normal news articles, and then we'll get to the info information stuff, move on by, past that, do some more stuff, get to our thingies of the week. Hopefully, um, there's no time constraints on this, and I will not be guiding us towards the end of the podcast like Matt normally does. So, fingers crossed, buckle up, this is going to be a long ride. All right, so what's our first news article of the day? Uh, I guess, uh, I guess we'll go with Steve leading us off. So what's what's your news article that you want to start off with? I want to start off. Okay. Uh, my first news article, you caught me off guard, is KDE delivers more Wayland fixes and Plasma 6.0 changes. Of course, it's going to be KDE news from the KDE Super Sim. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh uh, uh, they they are fixing a lot of things. I need to reopen the freaking article because I did. Uh, let's see here. It has come down to the good old fashioned bullet points on Pharonix. Here is what I'm reading. Uh, Arc the archiving program uh, added more features because you know more features to go with features on on KDE Plasma is always a good thing. Uh, several UI enhancements to make Elisa hopefully a good music player, which it is still not. Uh, Ocular Document Viewer has a has a brand new default toolbar layout because standards. Uh, <laughs> Plasma 6.0 will expose global actions for system restart and shutdown via key binding. So we have some implementation of global key binds on a Wayland session. Uh, improved error reporting when importing uh, VPN configurations because you know sometimes you don't want to troubleshoot your open VPN connection. Uh, and that's, been, a, that's Discover, been an issue for a lot of people. Well. Yeah, KDE Discover will actually tell you how uh, its download progress for flat packs, which is no, it's, amazing. Uh, showing the uh, the actual because the issue currently with Discover is when you download flat packs, it will show you uh, a quick. It will go from zero to one hundred, but the package is not actually downloaded. It still needs time to download it, so it stays at hundred percent until the package is actually downloaded. I've been through that, and I that's why I don't use Discover. And another re, uh, issue with Discover that they really need to figure out uh, that Nicolo talked about recently is the fact that uh, the reason, uh, uh, because Matt talked about it and he reacted to Matt's uh, video uh, where Matt complained about Discover being slow. The reason the Discover is slow because is because they in integrated the... Uh, the KDE store in it within it to update the uh, widgets and uh, themes that you get from the KDE store. But because the store is continuously having issues on the back end, it causes Discover to to hang and stall uh, and sometimes crash. So they need to freaking even if they have to, in my opinion, even if they have to remove the goddamn. Uh, 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 KDE store from it, remove it, make Discover uh, responsive and stop hanging. Uh, create a separate store if you have to for the widgets and whatnot for KDE store instead of keeping it hidden within settings. Not a lot of people uh, look deep within settings to figure out where, uh, the, the, they, where to get widgets and stuff. Either separate or fix the goddamn store. We uh, it, this the issue with the with the KDE store dot org uh, ha has existed for over three years. It's actually well existed way back in the day because it's yeah. still using the old Fling store front end. No. So they <laughs> need to g g fix it. Get a new host. Get s dedicated servers. I don't know what you do. Just stop with your uh, with this uh, with this sh uh, shitty backend. Uh, it's been you've been putting it on the back burner for long enough. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, for keyboards with an emoji key, hitting uh, uh, what? Hitting uh, hitting it will now open KDE's emoji picker now. Well, yeah, hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like you. <laughs> like it, it should have been the case uh, like a while ago. Uh, fixing the way GTK apps uh, uh, the way GTK apps scale themselves within the Plasma Wayland session. Yeah, more Wayland fixes. I cannot talk a lot about Wayland because uh, <clears throat> Nvidia don't use it. Mm -hmm. uh, Plasma no longer quits crashes when uh, when an app uh, sends a window uh, uh, title that's too long under Plasma Wayland session. Yes, uh, uh, this was mentioned by one of my users earlier t today. I guess uh, he tried Wayland. He installed Wayland on Zero Linux. He enabled Wayland on Zero Linux. He logged into Wayland. And he's got window because he uses uh, his language. I forgot what language it was. Some titles were much longer. It was causing windows to crash. He reported mm. it today on my GitHub. So uh, this is something good to see. Uh, screen recording and task manager thumbnails now work properly for NVIDIA GPUs with the proprietary drivers on Wayland. That alone to me is the biggest part of the whole article. Yeah, we, we definitely need to start seeing more uh, bullet points on these kind of articles hitting the NVIDIA GPU section when it comes to Wayland. Like that's, <laughs> they put it at the end for some reason. I know, I know which is wild. Like the biggest point, like, hey, it works with This is the biggest one. Yeah. I think it's fine because my GPU right now works better on Wayland than it does Xorg. <laughs> oh, by the way, Josh, Josh, since you, you are uh, the only one, well, since you are you, uh, it's normal that you're the only one who has the Arc GPU. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, me, uh, and many other distros uh, decided to remove the uh, XF86 video Intel because a lot of people with the Arc GPU told me that GP that driver has been deprecated for a long time. It's all baked into the kernel now. And yeah. actually, actually, keep it installed. Well, you should keep it installed Why? for older Intel like. Um, what is it? Older it, well, Intel you, iGPUs. Cause so what that pulls in is the old i9-15 driver, which the i9, which the Arc GPU does actually make callbacks to the i9-15 driver for, you know, they, stuff they, like they, the, qui the quick sync encoder. The i9-15, uh, they, in the article, it was something along the lines of i195 is causing crashes and what have you. So a yeah, lot of I'm, distros started removing the Intel XF86 video driver from their distros i decided to remove it as well but i told users if you need it you can manually install it yeah okay. that and uh older x applications will actually talk to to uh the uh and to the uh xf86 and in intel driver uh purely for like legacy library calls and stuff too so it's actually so basically not... uh that driver is re still required for some legacy hardware yes, yes. It, yes. it's required for your old-fashioned xor game it, uh applications i don't think um, uh any i think X, it's purely xor that's still making the calls it's nothing like the application itself so stuff like dwm uh dwm doesn't make any calls that dedicated to the gpu itself it's handling that through through an xor library which that which is what talks with the video driver no that, that, that's so why that's still, why those still... drivers start off with x because they are directly related to x oh yeah uh, and so. uh, the only ones i include on the zero linux iso are the uh the virtual ones the virtual virtual machine ones and uh that's it uh everything else is offered via the tool but and uh, i'm glad should i reintroduce should oh, no, i go... reintroduce the ability to install the intel drivers yes uh yes. it should be there yeah I think okay, I'll re I'll, I'll re put it. If if it does start causing crashes, then you can remove. But I'll be honest with you, I'm using it just fine. <laughs> and Josh and Josh is drinking out of the Zero Linux cup. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> well, uh, so actually, I'm glad that we started off on this article because it did remind me of what we skipped, and that would be what we did this week in Linux. So, um, <laughs> I, just because in chat, I've already seen quite a few people ask ask because I am back on Linux. Um, so I'll go ahead and start off and then we'll go clockwise. So Josh okay. and then Steve. Uh, but so what I did this week in Linux is I finally, not finally, but I got off of Windows. Uh, the the fact that like the power mafia in Microsoft is still super fucking strong. Like no matter 
what you do, you're not allowed to not have your computer go to sleep. Like Windows will not respect your never selection, no matter what. I even edited registry files. That bitch still goes to sleep and kills all your applications, which is just... Well, actually, I did find a way around that. You just constantly have to have a game running in the background, which for me and my addiction to Project Zomboy, that's not, not a problem. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not hard. I can do that. But so um, I, I did go ahead and switch off mainly because I, I really just wanted to find a Linux distro that was like st very focused on stability, but also at the same time, Zero G. Doesn't, it was doesn't very like crap. Well, no, Does, it was very polished. Like I just wanted yeah. everything uh, to match. Does uh, a high does high screen does a high display rate uh, uh rendering properly, you know? Yeah, high DPI the, you know rendering yeah, high is DPI, kind of like important. actual good high DPI support. Yes. That, zero G, zero no, G, zero G. No, no, it's no. Um, and it's not because it's zero G it's because it's GNOME. Uh, GNOME does, does not treat my ultra wide properly at all. Does not, there's a whole bunch of stuff that GNOME doesn't do right. And also Thank still you. to this day, it's not a completely cohesive experience, which it's much better than Thank KDE, you. but still is not cohesive. And on the bright side, as long as you're using the applications intended for your desktop environment, it actually looks beautiful. Yeah. The problem is that uh, the, you only have a selection of about 30 applications to pick from. <laughs> yeah. Now, so I tried out elementary OS, which I've picked on in the past uh, for being a new user focused distro and it just not being that great. Um, it's fucking phenomenal. Um, they've changed a lot since the last time I checked them out. It's great. High DPI dis display support is phenomenal. Um, uh, it making use of my ultra wide, very good. Um, it's not perfect, but it is surprisingly good. It's very, very close to Windows. Uh, if anyone who's on the elementary dev team ever wants to like fix it completely, talk to me. Uh, we, we can do that. Uh, I'll tell you exactly what needs to happen and what's not happening on a vertical ultra wide. I got you. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's been phenomenal. I have really, really enjoyed Elementary OS, and it is polished throughout. Like the, the amount of work that's gone on with Pantheon is insane. Like it's it's really good. Now it's not customizable. It's no at all, at all. It's which I don't have a problem with. It, it's a no. It's no downstream fork. Well, it yes, but it doesn't. Like the problem is, is like when you use it, it doesn't feel anything like a no at all. Like it's totally different but that's that's what i've been doing this week and that's why i'm back on linux uh josh what you've been up to uh so uh last week my venerable 5700 xt died uh the what the one gpu that has served me very well the past four and a half years uh, it's done everything from crypto mining to plex transcoding uh, and I think it finally decided to burn up and die in a pit of fire in in the wonderful clouds of the blue smoke when three of the when three of the capacitors blew up on it. Oh, fun! <laughs> fun. Yeah. And I'm sure that so, doesn't have anything to do with the mining that was happening on it. Like it, it sure all. doesn't. But yeah. you know, uh, we back when we were mining mining on it, we were not undervolting it like we were supposed to. We were overvolting it, you, you know, just to get more mining performance. <laughs> Yeah, so never, never, never mind about the fact that we do anything reasonable with our hardware. But uh, anyways, since then I have I have gone all in. On, I am running a one hundred percent pure Intel stack from top to bottom, CPU and GPU these days. Uh, as because you know the Linux six point two kernel came out. Unfortunately, six, uh, the Linux six point two kernel does not exist for Debian, and uh, the Linux kernel does not ship Intel Arc drivers. Yep. Who knew? Yep. <laughs> so uh, that that was a complete disaster, and of course, I failed the I failed the distro challenge. So I had to go and buy Matt's steak at some point this summer. But mm -hmm. anyways, as a result, I decided, you know what? Let's install Arch Linux, and then Arch Linux wonderful wonderful distribution works flawlessly, no problem whatsoever. Not the fact that I actually had to dial up the network administrator at my ISP just to set up a dedicated package mirror for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, then, uh, you and know, then it stopped. 
Yeah, and then, uh, you know, I just ran, you know, a Yay Tech SYU running something like 60 plus uh, rather critical AUR packages. And of course, the whole operating system broke. So I installed Zero G, which, you know, I had this really old ISO for Zero G. I ran an update, broke grub. Oh, no, the terror. So it's just like, okay, so then I had to blow up, blow up Zero G. And then it's like, tell you what, we're just going to take the time to figure out like all this wonderful tooling that uh, Steve uses for di for his distro. We, j we created our own a fork of zero linux we're going to we call it hype zero because we're not using hyperland <laughs> <laughs> but just to let you know just to let you know steve your mirror works a lot more reliably than any other arch mirror that i've actually experimented with besides my isp's dedicated uh package mirror <laughs> just to let you oh, know cool. <laughs> get lab those actually were generated and new. those were generated from lebanon oh. yep <laughs> <laughs> so uh Right now, we are currently running our own fork of of uh, Zero Linux. It is not actually Zero G. There is no fancy theme work. It is literally just Bonestock GNOME with no actual applications besides GNOME applications because GNOME is king. <laughs> All right. Steve, what you been up to? Hopefully well, you know not jumping through up. hoops like that. No, no, definitely not. I was just uh, trying to get Calamares to look as awesome as it ended up uh, for all the people who downloaded the latest uh, release, which which, were, which went online last night. Uh, well, uh, Calamaris looks better than it ever did, and thanks to the to the to the guys over at Core ISO uh, Telegram channel, uh, they helped me a lot. Uh, I ported it to three point three alpha, but it's. I don't consider it alpha uh, alpha quality. I consider it more like RC quality because it's been in alpha to stay, uh, for like a year. But I've been tinkering with Calamares a lot and uh, working on uh, with someone from uh, Mastodon uh, on the new Zero Linux 2. I was supposed to ship it with the new release, but due to uh, work and hectic work and stuff on his end, he wasn't able to finish it. So I'm gonna release it as, a, as an update soon. Uh, but other than that, I was uh, 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 doing something that we're gonna talk about at the end when we reach our thingy of the week, cause it's gonna be hilarious. So buckle up, people. All right. Okay, so let's get back to the articles because I'm sure we're going to take plenty of time with all of these. Uh, Josh, what's your article of the week? Oh, my article is a spicy one. Uh, Docker apologizes, uh, but they're still going to force you to pay up uh, if you're in an open source team. So anyways, uh, Docker is, you know, a, a buzz phrase that's been going around in industry and all that. And, uh, you know, everybody loves Docker. Everybody loves pulling things from Docker. But unfortunately, the Docker hub itself needs to monetize. And uh, they've badly needed to monetize since 2017. They're they're. Doc Docker's finances are something else if you ever want to go down a rabbit hole. But anyways, what's going on is that Docker put out an announcement about three or four days ago saying that uh, any or any team or organization is going to need to start paying for the for a subscription. That way, Docker will actually host their projects on Docker Hub. Uh, the four hundred and twenty dollars, I think, four hundred seventy dollars. Uh, it is sixty dollars a year. Per project oh. basically if you're if you're in like a full team is 300 if you're a proper business making profits and all that stuff it's 1400 or something like that but anyways uh so because they did a wonderful miscommunication even even up to this article uh basically they're saying that uh yeah we're, we came out with this program saying that hey if you're an open source project that's that's operating as a team you can uh Y you can I need to learn how to talk give me a second <laughs> don't worry I'm right I'm right this is gonna be one of those days as soon as my article yeah. comes up I'm gonna do the same thing <laughs> but anyways uh doc docker came out and said okay so you can sign up for like this sponsorship thing where we'll where you can still use a team account and still publish your thing uh and people will have sent in emails asking for uh access to the sponsorship thing of which they've gotten no replies 
and uh, all of their third party, all of their official communications are being dealt with through Twitter and GitHub issues, which, you know, is a great, fantastic resource to do anything but make a blog post on Docker on Docker Hub's website like they should to address all these concerns. Dude, if I am going to get customer support through Twitter, th- fuck that. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ne- never at Team YouTube for anything. It's just a waste. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, but Anyways, uh, this doesn't affect just Docker. This will also affect Podman because this is a container registry host. This is the repository you're pulling your containers from. So realistically, the only solution right now is to stop posting your your projects on the Docker hub and instead either self-host or find another register register to uh, pull your Docker containers from. Uh, I know the Linux server IO team actually has their own repository that they're going to be posting all their containers to. And uh, that's really about the only group that I really know of. Hmm. Thankfully, a lot of the uh, self-hosted applications that you're pulling from the Docker Hub are actually not team managed, but they're actually individually managed, For which for that basically means... Uh, means that uh, if you're posting your Docker container as an individual rather than a team, it's actually free of charge. Yeah, I'm 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 interested to see uh, how Docker does financially in the future. Because you are right, if no one's checked out Docker's financials, it's fun. Check it <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, it's, like... it's a lot of fun. <laughs> It's a wonder the that only they can one here still that manage. Doesn't, has never used Docker or got interested with Docker or needed Docker. Well, your website's hosted on Docker. Yeah. What? Your website's your website, hosted on Docker. Yeah, it's hosted on Docker. What? It, what, what does that mean? I, I don't know what you mean. Well, it, my... it, it it it's hosted through a Docker container, which most most are. I mean most. Most VPNs are using essentially Docker for, or not VPNs, uh, VPSs for very basic stuff. Like, oh, that's what a lot of people use. It's just a doc. It's essentially a Docker container if it's not literally a Docker container. Oh, it's a it's a regular site. web host with cPanel. Yeah, uh, cPanel only distributes their software through a Docker container these days. So oh, when you load the cPanel that, interface, you're connected <laughs> to a Docker container to be able to host that. I learned something new today. Okay, cool. you're welcome. No, I mean, that doesn't mean you're, like, getting into the nitty-gritty of Docker, but still. Like, Docker is one of those things where, like, even if you don't make use of it, you probably, especially if you're hosting stuff or doing stuff on the internet, you, you're you probably making use of Docker in places where you're not directly so, having to. So, uh, if, if it's a VPS, most probably they're using Docker. There's, like, a 90, there's like a 99% chance, unless it's some old-school st- shop that's still using bsd for all their servers yeah or yeah even even if they're not using docker they're using a docker like solution probably proprietary or something this is how this is how they uh they distribute on a mass scale basically yeah yeah yeah. docker makes it very easy yeah it's uh reproducible that's what it is yeah and you can clone and stuff like that yeah yeah so by the way should i do this update uh, it's got Alsa, uh, probably Alsa not. Alsa topology in the in the name. Probably so not. It's something Pro- to do with Alsa. Just, just, just probably not. <laughs> probably should not update your system at uh, you know, uh, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So no, because for... Pamac has been nagging me in the tray, telling me there are updates. Yeah. So I'm like staring that, at it. Okay. Should that I do bitch the can update? wait. T- trust me. That bitch can wait. <laughs> All right, okay. so for my article this week, I've got NordVPN has open sourced its Linux VPN client and libraries. So that just means that today we can talk about our sponsor, NordVPN. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Like, no, we're not. We're not going there. All right. So I was about to say, you better not start a VPN segment because, you know, I will rage at you. Hey, hey, <laughs> come on. Like, we, we got to get money somehow. And I mean, Especially it, Nord. Look, look, if the can FBI... I, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, what is that? a VPN? You don't know what a VPN okay. is? Seriously? You so don't make use of used one, so... Realistically, this is how a VPN works. Have you ever heard of, like, a proxy before, right? Yes, Or basically, you just bounce in your internet traffic UAE, to one they use a proxy. Yeah. yeah, a VPN is literally just a proxy, except that you're sending all your traffic through the one pipe. Yeah. Uh basically all you're doesn't doing it blow up? No. No, no. So like uh, uh, like the most basic version of it. I was just kidding. 
<laughs> well, that's why I said, are you serious? And you said, yes. Like, there are people I out there you, who I don't I wanted know. you to see if you're going to believe it or not. Like, oh, geez. Virtual private networks. I know what it is. Okay. I'm glad somebody but does. I don't use Especially it Especially in Lebanon. I figured that you would know exactly what that is. Yeah. Uh, Everybody we... uses it here, but I don't understand. I tried to use it once, and it slowed down the internet traffic uh, maybe 100,000-fold. Yes, it will slow down your traffic depending on where you're connecting. And to. my connection is slow already, so why would I need one? <laughs> well, you would need one when your country cares about uh, piracy. That's that's when they come real in handy. Which my but, country doesn't. But people yeah, use yeah. it mostly for something called Flixnet, Netflix, something like that. Yeah, try oh, to get yeah. that American Netflix or something like that. Uh, yeah. Actually, Japanese Netflix, to my understanding, is actually really awesome. And I should uh, try connecting to Japan. And Well, I mean, I've connected to Canada you'll to get some shows. You'll be watching a lot <laughs> of anime. <laughs> All right, so well, some, something like Japanese reality TV. <laughs> well, all right. So for those who do understand what VPNs are, and you you then you've probably heard of NordVPN, the best VPN, definitely not a honeypot. Like there's literally zero chance that it's FBI owned or funded. De zero chance of that. Um, so they've decided what to open source. Have, what does uh, Zero Linux have to do with it? You said zero. Well. Hopefully, zero zero Linux is also funded zero percent by the FBI. But you know, <laughs> I don't know if there's something you got to tell us. Let us know. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, NordVPN is trying to be more transparent. Which, um, sure, okay. So I I, I got to ask the question now that NordVPN is gonna like open source some of their stuff are like, would either of y'all be in? Well, I know Steve's not interested in VPN, but Josh, like, do you now trust, trust Nord VPN more? Uh, no, because I prefer WireGuard over open VPN. Oh, come on now. Come on. <laughs> Actually, I don't even think Nord's using the uh, open VPN. I think they're using their own VPN protocol. Oh yeah. I definitely don't trust it. <laughs> okay, so Nord said we're making these products open source as a sign of our commit commitment to transparency and accountability. That is that is a load of market speak, and it, but it quite frankly, a, it's a it's a heap of shit. That's what it, it is. It is like the most accurate market speech off of a Nord VPN ad that I've ever yeah. seen, right there. But you know, at the same time, that doesn't mean that I'm going to sign up for Nord VPN. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I genuinely I I. I I just saw this. And I was like, "All right, we have to talk about it." Because like, there's, there, if there's one VPN company that I truly believe is a honeypot and ran by a government agency, it's NordVPN. Like, uh, it's definitely, definitely 100%. NordVPN. Because so, you know yeah. they're the ones that are like paying YouTubers to advertise that the, you know you install the NordVPN and suddenly you're secure and private from every website ever. Yeah. yeah. When in reality, you're only secure from where you are. To where the VPN is hosted, and that's it. <laughs> and Surfshark is also pretty bad, Clay. You got that right. But at the same time, um, all VPNs, all VPN ads, just take them all with a grain of salt. They're not, they're not as private as they actually claim to be. Even, even Mulvad. Yeah, Mulvad, private internet access, like it doesn't matter. They're, they're all, they're all stealing your shit. Like if we're being honest, or at least documenting it, like. I guess people don't understand like laws and regulations, like where these places are ran. Essentially, unless your VPN is ran off an island in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, it, they're keeping records. Like it's it's how it works. It's just it's just how it um, works. You said keeping records, uh, vinyl records. Yes. Yes. yes vinyl records. Yes. I like that. I mean, that's the best way of storing information. Oh, wait, hold on. You guys don't have you. You guys don't use records for your ISOs. Where do you reliably oh, uh, host them? We use we. Uh, me have big collection record, big good big disc, black disc. Well, I would like one with zero G on it. Uh, you know, as quickly as you well, can send it. Well, you know, <laughs> I still have a bunch of floppy disks for, with Slackware three. Why? <laughs> 
Why? We are welcome to the 21st century, boss. Because I paid seventeen dollars for it back in like uh, 2007 or something like that. And and what about that seventeen dollars? Air marks it for never getting put in the trash bin. <laughs> no, but on a serious note, you're right. Uh, VPNs they keep records even if you if they tell you that uh, no, we don't, and uh, we don't track you. We don't. No, don't. The, uh, for for them to say that, to have a reason to say that, that means they are doing. It. Yeah. Well, of course. Like, I guess just some people don't understand yeah. the idea of a honeypot. Like, they like the, the idea. Only VP, the only VPN I will actually take any privacy. I'll I'll take any privacy features with seriously is Mulved, and that's just because you can write your account number on on an envelope and send them cash. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that's the only one I trust for that reason. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, uh, when I was in Dubai, I had no choice but to use a VPN or mm -hmm. a, yeah. used to call them the proxy breakers because over there they blocked, uh, they controlled the the media and yeah. uh, the newspapers and stuff like that. They didn't. They only wanted you to to get informed through their controlled media. Yeah. So any outside sources, kind of like China, but not on that massive a scale. Yeah. The, Still, uh, you can access uh, pirate sites, porn sites, uh, other news outlets. Uh, so we had to use VPNs for that. But back in the day, back in the 90s, we never called them VPNs. We just called them anti-proxy. Yeah. Uh, yep. Because, uh, I mean, that's, so, that's quite frankly what they are. That's, that's yeah, the, exactly. But... Uh, the, 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 but you notice virtual, immediately private like the private part there like yeah it sells exactly. the product so much better yeah <laughs> private is not really private they keep your data they sell it whenever they they want w without even letting you know uh all that uh, uh, that's why uh now because i used to work three uh, like a few years ago i i worked there for three years we tried to use uh, VPNs, but the government banned the use of VPN. Yeah. If you try to use a VPN, as soon as it's detected, your internet uh, account uh, gets a flag. That's uh, when you spin up a VPS and uh, you know just SSH tunnel everything. Basically, make a D make your own uh, VPN over port twenty two. That's what, that's one way of doing it, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the long way of doing it, the Josh way of doing it. But <laughs> still, uh, it's annoying because a lot of people in the Emirates wanted to uh, watch content on Netflix uh, that, that was outside the UAE because in UAE is one of those countries where they, uh, where they uh, had sp uh, movies made specifically for them with uh, love scenes cut out, with kissing yeah. scenes cut out, oh. with... Uh, live instead of, for my article, instead of uh, blurring or any of that god forbid they just so and if a movie was an hour and 48 minutes you end up watching 59 minutes a movie lo uh, 59 yeah. minutes long yeah they like, gotta they gotta uh, censor all of the all of the disturbing scenes like you know characters so kissing. exactly <laughs> and people wanted oh, access no to the full unedited version uh, uncensored version and whatnot uh, they needed a VPN, but now they ban VPNs because the, the UAE, the mo most, the VPNs were mostly used on routers because in the UAE, uh, to make a FaceTime call, you had to pay uh, around 15 extra bucks on your cell, uh, cell phone uh, uh, carrier or whatever. Uh, to make a WhatsApp call, it's 25 bucks yeah. extra. I mean, that's what so, VPNs were always for, is getting around legislation in your area. That was bullshit. Yeah, so. but boy, do they have a lot of data on everyone. Boy, do they have a lot of data on everyone. Hmm. Because well, everyone is using them. Yeah. Well, all right. So let's go on to the uh, contact information, then we'll move on to the next round of articles. Um, so let me try to do this without completely butchering it. So if you would like to contact us... Here's where you can go to do it. Uh, first thing that you probably want to do is go over to subscribe uh, to, uh, you know, Matt's channel. Like, let's get that that out of the way. So Project you can go Gumbo. over, go over to the LinuxCast.org website. 
No, stop talking about Project Zomboid. Stop. Okay, so <laughs> go over. You can subscribe, uh, and you can also check out Matt's website, and it has all of these links to everything over there. But make sure to you know, go to the LinuxCast channel, subscribe to Matt's actual channel to get the rest of these podcasts and stuff. Uh, you can also go over and hit him up on Patreon at patreon.com slash the LinuxCast. Uh, also, subscribe. Uh, again, already talked about that. You can also subscribe here, because who knows? Might, might, might be doing this in the future have no idea um and uh you can also subscribe to josh's channel uh, and check out his website at tinleyj.com slash stalker perfect url beautiful you're welcome uh you can also check out steve's channel a link to that will be in the description uh and you can also email us at email at the linuxcast.org um matt will get that uh, i will not um and then you can also check us check us out uh and contact us through the linuxcast.org slash contact page as well um also don't forget we do have a merch store as well um i don't think it's down in the description but i'm pretty sure you can find that over at the linuxcast.org so if you want to pick up you know shirts with matt's logo on it or my meme face on the back of it you can do that um and yeah i'm the only one here without merch well it's probably a good thing because like i gotta be honest i checked on our teespring and it's been a year since i did that and so i was like oh i'm sure we'll have an order we didn't the last time I checked, which is probably like a week or two start ago. plugging it. I, well, that's the thing. We do such a terrible job of plugging it. Most people don't even know it exists. So, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So, uh, we've covered the contact page, and I guess we'll get back into the articles. And I will guess I'll let Steve kick us off with the next article. The next article. This time I have it in its front of me. Wine 8.4 released with the early Wayland graphics driver code 51 bug fix. Finally, Wine is getting some, uh, is giving love to Wayland. Not that I care, but uh, <clears throat> for now. People yeah. don't get angry at me for now. I'm still, me, I, I'm going to say one thing before I start talking about the, 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 this article. Uh, I talked about it on my podcast, but I need to get it out there because Matt keeps complaining. And sometimes me being K- KDE super simp, uh, sometimes I don't understand. Okay, KDE, I agree with uh, everybody that says KDE is full of bugs. Yes, I do agree. KDE has bugs. Oh boy, I know. Uh, but if you're patient enough, you remember that bug I kept tell- telling you about many episodes uh, for multiple episodes that uh, i get when, uh, whenever watching videos something happens it stutters for a second and then it goes back to normal yeah well i thought it was at some point i started thinking it was something wrong with my hardware but finally it got addressed it was an issue with the amd u code in the kernel so amd sent a last minute patch to uh, the kernel 6.2.6 where they fixed it Oh, uh, it wasn't me. So be patient with KDE. Be patient with everything. With enough patience, everything will fix itself. That being said, uh, uh, Wine uh, getting uh, support uh, uh, or initial uh, support for Wayland, that's a huge step forward, especially for gamers. Uh, For me, uh, that means the Steam Deck will at some point uh, integrate Wayland once Wine gets uh, more stable on the Wayland side. But what the article says uh, is uh, the the Wine Wayland DRV is is uh, already in the code. But unfortunately, this article is very uh, it's, it's very on short. a diet because that's <laughs> all it says basically <laughs> that the Wayland driver is already inside Wine, but not activated. So uh, uh, isn't yet ready for end users or gamers, but is an early at an early stage work in progress. It will take some time still before this native Wayland support is ready to compl- complement the X Wayland support. Well, X Wayland is like running Z- Xorg inside Wayland. So yeah. It's well, like emulating Xorg. Just so we're clear, the uh, the Steam Deck does actually use Wayland. Um, 
it, it uses most uh pretty much all the games are ran through no not pretty much all all the games are ran through gamescope which is actually a wayland compositor so this wait 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 wait, wait. go back go back a second you're telling me the steam deck is running on wayland yes 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 but 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 they were running on pulse audio yeah yes you can use pulse audio with wayland yeah that said uh, the only reason why a pipe wire is used on wayland is purely for video mm-hmm. or it's using video using cap. it on obs yeah Basically. that that's oh. that's why you keep hearing about pipe wire and wayland plus uh pulse audio doesn't have like actual native support for record recording desktop applications on on wayland as well because of the wayland protocols so that's so that's why the pipe that's why uh there's a pipe pipe wire back end used by pulse audio so you've actually always had pipe wire on on the steam deck all right yeah i noticed it uh, when i updated yeah it's just that now they've, my setting. yeah it's just now that they're actually using it uh by default so they have they have both pulse and wayland uh, and uh, pipe wire pipe wire yeah. uh, yes yeah so they've been using I, uh, since when, I got it. They've been using Pulse Dash Pipewire uh, for yeah. certain stuff. I'm not, I, I don't I think just they're using Pulse it, for everything. Uh, yeah. When when they updated and broke all my settings. <laughs> yeah. If you type in, uh, if you open up the terminal and just type in PACTL info, it will tell you what backend you're actually using. Yeah, uh, but I noticed that during the update after it broke my stuff, uh, it said Pulse Pipewire, and I was like. All this time, I was telling people that uh, uh, the Steam Deck is not using Wayland because it's using pu- uh, Pulse Audio. I was wrong. I now, was like, when you okay. when you enter desktop mode on uh, the Steam Deck, you're actually using Xorg. I actually don't think you're actually using Wayland on desktop yes, mode. Yes, yes. The desktop mode, I, I'm 99.9% sure, loads up using X. I believe you can switch it over to Wayland. Um, but it's also kd on wayland which is something else right now yeah yeah yeah. it's functional yes it is functional but you can i i wouldn't say that's switch but how can you switch if you don't see the lock screen when you log out it takes you to the steam ui uh there yeah well you could okay you can do it i i'm pretty sure i don't know the steps but it's not going to be logging out switching it at the login manager going back in i think you have to edit config files so that when you load up the desktop mode it, instead of pulls, instead of loading up with Xorg, because I mean, essentially, when you're switching from the Steam UI mode to the desktop mode, uh, it's it's like it's using the same like type of configs that a login manager would use. So it's it's doing the work of a login manager behind the scenes, and then you get hit with the desktop mode. So I'm oh, okay. pretty sure so you just edit edit... configs. Yeah, I need to edit the, the the SDDM config or whatever. Yeah, whatever. I, I don't. Again, I'm. I, I don't think they're actually using a login manager, but they essentially have their, you know, minimal, not really login manager. Oh, but okay, is a okay. Login. I got you. Yeah, I'll have to edit the config of that. Yes, to, to and then you to... can get it. I I, oh, okay. I know I've seen some people talk about it because I've I've read about people switching over the desktop mode. To so I wasn't it. wrong by telling people on the desktop mode it wasn't using Wayland. No, you're not wrong. It 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 should be running X. But when you load up a game, I I pretty sure even in the desktop mode, uh, the way Steam is configured, it tries to load up every game still through using GameScope, which GameScope is yeah, of a course Wayland because if you get the overlay and everything. Yeah. 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 Well, all right. So, uh, yeah. So back to this article, I still think this is a big deal for everyone who is using Wayland on the desktop or. It is definitely a big deal because as somebody that's been tracking Wayland progress for a very long time, Wayland is actually a lot more efficient than Xorg, uh, simply because, you know, Wayland's not actually running like a full display stack in the background on your system. So as a result, you're getting improved battery performance you're at, and uh, you will actually get better GPU performance because GPU is well, actually well, doing less there on was Wayland. one report, sorry to cut you off, Josh, but there was one report on my server where someone switched to Wayland and ran a game on Wayland. You notice that anti-aliasing was not all that great on Wayland. Well, let me let me get to that. I was I was actually just getting to it. that. That said, uh, a lot of GPU drivers, especially like the AMD and Intel drivers specifically, Intel seems to actually work a little bit better than AMD in this regard. But the dri- but the actual driver stack for Wayland is still not nearly as mature on Xorg. Uh, that said, specifically for stuff like uh, anti-aliasing, there's a difference in the way of how. Wayland translates anti-aliasing than Xorg does, and uh, that that's actually part of the reason why. 
So and, yes, you, yes, there are still some pain points, especially when you know it comes to like your video games looking looking great and amazing on a uh, Wayland compared compared to XOR. How do they do but, it on the Steam Deck? How do they make them look so good? They're running uh, because uh, your games are being ran through X Wayland. That's why they're not Wayland native. Uh, oh, okay, not. Yes, no. Well, Ten, some games are Wayland native, yeah. You and also the the big thing about the uh, the Steam Deck is their driver stack that that we're complaining about is much better than any oh, other. Oh yeah, regular uh, they're, they're using they're using their own implementation of the Mesa exactly. of the Mesa driver. Yeah, they're and using their it own has already yeah. reached their repositories. Twenty three dot one reached their repositories, and it's not even on Arch yet. Yeah, they have that. That's that's kind of why the Steam Deck's not a great comparison because they're they're essentially cheating compared to the rest of like Wayland Gaming like world because they have their they have their own driver implementation that's it's just more fine tuned for what they're doing. Yeah, um, because it's a device that does one that was created for one thing and one thing only with yeah. one target. Whereas on uh, and the mo on the more broader broader scale, it's it's supposed to do a million different other things at the same time. Yep. So yeah, I would I would see why it's so much better on the Steam Deck. Yeah. But uh, all 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 that, but the battery is still to me abysmal on the Steam Deck. Uh, yes, the but at, yes, but at the same time, it's really hard really hard to stuff a battery in a device like that yeah that's running is. a lit a legitimate like yeah t technically it's a laptop processor but not really it is a beefed up laptop processor and it's just it's I difficult could literally I, and the funny part is i could literally watch the battery go down yeah well i'm yeah. playing yeah. i could watch uh, it that's uh Stick down it's also with like game optimizations because you know uh, PC games are not actually optimized for efficiency yeah, like they are on consoles. They're, it's doing double the work. It's do yeah. pulling double duty. Yeah. So it's it's so, running the game. It's converting the code. It's, yeah. it's and, and the fact it's that you pulling can double get, double duty. Really, in all honesty, like it, you do have to give it to them. The fact that you can run Cyberpunk on that device with decent settings and get two plus hours like you probably won't get three but you can get you two can plus get hours you can get more you can get more you can get up to five to six hours playing the the cyberpunk if you play it uh via uh remote like render it on yeah. your pc and yes via streaming and, and that's, that would give you a lot more hours playing cyberpunk and the 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 cool part about that is in a lot of use cases, that's how people are going to end up using the deck because you're gonna you're you're already going to have your big desktop computer somewhere in the house. But yeah. if you want to play that game that you would play sitting at the de at the computer on the couch, you know where you you know you can have the converse like the random uh -huh. conversations with your family, you're going to get way more battery life out of it, and it's probably going to be a uh, a more useful use case. Uh, yeah, and especially with uh, uh, if you want to run games directly on the Steam Deck, the Steam Deck is beautiful. Or in 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 uh, Tyler's words, sexy. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, when you play indie titles, ooh, and and emulation. It, really, in all honesty, it's built for that. It's built it, for that. It, even if you want to play AAA games, it is the. The great part about the Steam Deck is a short, like, if you want to play a AAA game and, you know, you're close to beating it or you just want to get into it and you got a short flight, man, the Steam Deck is lit. Like, it is awesome. Because if you've got a short flight, you can get in. The battery most likely will not die before you land. And you can you can have a nice, I'm like, gonna AAA game. I'm going to be testing it. I'm going to be testing it because my flight is an hour and a half. Oh, perfect, uh, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, you could definitely you could definitely fit in a nice AAA gaming experience on that flight. No problem. Yeah, but I I'm I'm uh, and uh, so everybody knows uh, I'm gonna be joining the Project Zomboid team uh, soon as soon as we get off this call because it just finished downloading and uh, it was only two gigs. I thought it yeah. was bigger than that. No, no, it's a super small game. It's great. 
Yeah, well, I'm going to be installing it via GOG installer because I got it as a GOG dev game because it's still in development, if nobody knows. Yes. Uh, uh, That's it's still in actually, development. Actually, we're going to pivot and we're going to talk about that for a second because, again, we're going to make this longer and we've only been going for less than an hour, so we got time for tangents, boys. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of Project Zomboid, actually, I believe it was Josh that made the argument. He took a uh -oh, look at I it. I tickled the beast. I woke yeah, the beast. Yeah. So he took a look at Project Zomboy and said he was not interested because it was early access. No, Which, no, 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 no. It doesn't exactly. early access does not mean it's not good. Exactly. Well, it doesn't matter to I've me been, that I've it's been not playing good. I've been playing Wreckfest since the day it started. Uh, they released it as a early early alpha. Well, hold, hold on. So the point of early access is for games that are not finished and that are currently under active development and change frequently like a game that like apex legends should not be early access because all you're going to do is be adding more content to the game that's all you're doing dlc so exactly they should, they should launch them as dlcs exactly or, or just consistently update the game like that is that is not a use case for early access early access means active development and where the changes that you're going to be making literally change the gameplay itself and uh yeah a good example fine. of that is like i think it was like six months ago project zomboy did their animations update where they overhauled a lot of the animations and the actual difficulty of the game got way harder so everything about like the early access argument with project zomboy I don't get because it's one of the few games in early access for one that isn't doesn't denigrate the name early access because it's not just a shit game. And then two, also, it's literally exactly what early access was originally designed for. It's a game that it, it, you can play and you can have a lot of fun with, but also is under active development like essentially if you won't play project zomboid because it's early access you should not ever touch zero ad because that bitch is still an alpha and it is i mean it's been an alpha for like what 20 years like, yeah like it's and that but, game's great yeah but when i when, well, uh, my, like, my big complaint about like early access is that there are some games that are like 10 plus years old that are still early access and they have not updated online. in like three or four EVE years. Online? Yeah, EVE Online is actually one of them, but even though uh, I don't buy EVE Online through Steam, I, I buy it fr from the proper channels. <laughs> well, I have, well, I've literally never uh, played EVE Online, but I have heard of it a lot. Case in point, lot case in point, Diablo 4, the uh, beta, it's still in development, it's active development, it won't be ready until summer. But they're uh, they're using it for uh, in the correct terms, uh, uh, developer beta or whatever they're calling it. Uh, same thing with uh, Wreckfest. I've been playing it since its alpha days, and it was constantly uh, 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 being uh, developed. But like Tyler said, Wreckfest was not really uh, uh, in development. It was more adding content throughout its uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, or whatever you call it, days, uh, uh, until it got released. It was they were constantly adding cars, tracks, uh, stuff mm -hmm. like that, but they were not developing it. Yeah. Uh, they were just adding content, so they were not using the the correct terminology because it was uh, on Steam. It said early access. Now, get, uh, uh, now, I will go ahead and give the devil his due on Josh's argument. Um, no matter what, if the game is still in is still in development, I don't think a game should go early access, period, anymore, just because early access itself holds a very bad stigma. Like, very bad. Early access is like, you are going, it's like giving you first dibs before it goes online. Well, it's, yeah, well, uh, Really, my, my argument stems from the fact nowadays, no matter what, there's so many shit early access games. Oh, like, yeah. you, you honestly yeah. get surprised. Like, if you find an early access game and, like, it's got a demo or you end up buying it and it's good, you're surprised, which yeah. is not a good thing. Like, I, so in Josh's defense, I don't think Project Zomboid should be an early access game just because of 
what early access has become. Now, yes. in Project Zomboid's defense, it is a very good early access game, and it's also meant for early access. Yep. But still, and I got it, and and, and and uh, I have good news. Uh, I got it legit. I just need to install Galaxy to be able to access uh, online stuff. But uh, I got it legit for free. Yes. Uh, why? Is it wait? Hold because on. Because it's still an active available? development. Is it still available for free through GOG? Well, uh, well, here's the here's the thing. No, uh, the copy oh. I got is it says it's four months old. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. So that one is when they stopped giving it for free. Uh, ah, gotcha. So four months ago they pulled the plug, and now it's uh, you have to buy it. But uh, I got an older version that's legit, but it's four months old, so I won't have access to the latest updates. Yeah, I can't and... update it might also make it more difficult to play multiplayer uh, yeah not sure, and but. and it, 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 it i cannot update it uh, the guy over there uh i have a friend who has internal access and stuff like that you know uh, that kind of thing he was like i have a copy uh, of uh project zomboy but it's four months old this is the last one they uh, that was available for free uh you won't have access to the latest, greatest, and uh, whatever. I was like, it's fine. I just want to test it. I just uh, I want to see what my friend Zany is all ab uh, is on about. Uh, so it's okay. Uh, I'm gonna be playing it out alone all by myself anyway. I'm not a multi multiplayer gamer. Uh, so well, I'm the just solo gonna experience. Is... See how it goes. Yeah, you're but gonna have as, fun. If you, if it's like you said, it's an it's a. I need something. Uh, I realized this thing about myself lately. I don't play uh, games that are uh, that have action, a lot of action anymore. I like sit back and relax kind of game. Okay, you told me this is a frustrating game because the game literally starts by telling you this is how you died. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it on your stream. I was like, what kind of game starts like that? Uh, so... Uh, Okay, I don't have a problem in dying in this kind of game because I saw it's isometric perspective type of view. So it's kind of relaxing. You can go into a house, you can plumage uh, in the house, and you can spend hours in the house without being attacked or attacking anyone. So yeah. to me, it's, it, it's a bit of both. It's a little bit of action when you go out to survive, but you go back to a house, you close all the doors, you're good. You're relaxed. Yep. You, you can, can do some base sit building. And enjoy and discover. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, okay. I'll that's, give it a go. That, that's what I really enjoy about the game. It's got a balance of both worlds. You've got, yeah. you've got, so you've got, if you your... leave the house, this is when you want the action to happen. You want to get frustrated. You want to die. You want to restart. But I have a question for you, Mr. Project Zomboid. Uh, when you die, what kind of death is it? Do you, have, uh, do you restart everything? Do you lose everything? Uh, what type of I assume that it? you lose everything because the zombies eat you. Yes. So what? Like what happens? This is. It's a very really interesting game. So like your your map creation is separate from your character creation. So you can load up a world, create create like a game instance with a world, and so you have a start date in the world and so you can go in and survive like let's say you survive in game for six months then you get bitten and you slowly die in turn or you just get overwhelmed and eaten by a horde like what's going to happen your character screams like you know like dies and then they'll turn back into a zombie and you're given an option of quitting and you can go back and just overwrite that save or delete the save whatever and create a whole new world and a new character or it'll also give you an option to just create a new character. And so you can create a new character with different traits, whatever. And you can go back into that same world that you've already been in for forever. And you can start over fresh again. You'll be later in the world. So like it'll be later after the apocalypse and everything. Um, but you can actually go back with that new character to where your old character died. And you'll see the zombified version of you. You can beat the shit out of them and take back all of your old gear oh. that you had on. Oh, so. okay. Okay. That's an interesting, that that's an interesting way of doing things. Yeah. So you it, it's either actually really cool. start over from scratch or you can build a new character, but pick up, uh, uh, pick up where your old character uh, and kill your old character because he's a zombie. Yeah. Now, I mean, okay. again, 
like it's not it's easier said than done because you're again going to be starting off as a completely new character with you're going to have negative traits so you're going to have to like let's say you're a smoker you're going to have to find more sigs a lighter you're going to have to you're going to have to you know get equipped to go back into the area because if you died earlier unless you died somewhere super safe out of starvation or whatever you're going to have to go there kill the horde that killed you or whatever and then be able to get your old body and get everything back so yeah but you have okay 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 you wow that's interesting that's 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 i've never seen that in a game before because it's... yesterday last night i was playing dead cells and what's interesting about dead cells every time you respawn it's random the world changes yeah uh, the, there's so not you, that you are you start off where the, it, the area looks similar to where you started the first couple of times but as you move forward the area has changed it's no longer um, three doors now you have ledges you got zombies you got skeletons and you got enemies uh, it's like it's a, the world randomly regenerates so I really got frustrated with the game and stopped playing it because of that. I was like, my, the way I used to play games back, back uh, when I played the indie games was like, okay, I died multiple times in this uh, in this game you, at this area, so I memorized yeah, everything. Yeah, you die so I, you can learn. Like Yeah, you die yeah. so you can learn. But in this one, you cannot learn. You have to always unlearn what you have learned because the, the world keeps randomly generating. Yeah. So I'm like, ugh. That's frustrating. And Matt warned me about that because that's the game he he played on the Steam Deck. I was like, how frustrating could it be? And yeah, I cannot play with cheats because the world is randomly generated. So that <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I give up on this game. I just want now Project Zomboid and I want and I'm playing Wreckfest to death because uh, the last time I played a Destruction Derby game was in the PlayStation 1 day. Destruction yeah. Derby 2. Well, all right. so, so we, we are we, we are going to need to get back to the to the topics because we have been talking about video games for like 15 minutes and i'm sure some people <laughs> in chat are like i thought this was going to be linux so okay. which we'll get, we'll mean, get we'll back about games on linux i mean it can i talk about an upcoming uh, new distro that everybody should be installing right now what? sure well you see apparently there are now more than dozens of open suso users there are now hundreds uh, as OpenSUSE Open yeah, Open uh, Open Leap last month has reported that they're getting 360,000 downloads in a single day. Yes, uh, and this is and your as article. a result, uh, you know, apparently people are using SUSE. People, there are there are geckos. Holy crap! <laughs> you got geckos. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, the only art, the only news article referencing this that I found was this super super opinionated article where it's just like a uh, hating. A lot of it's really just like going like, yeah, people are using OpenSUSE because apparently they're tired of Canonical's bullcrap. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, if we're reason. being honest, that's, that's kind of it. Yeah, that's the reason. That's the reason for the uh, for the new uh, Linux, uh, I mean, Ubuntu Flatpak Remix existence. So yeah, but uh, you know, th June this is... 2020 or in June 2022, the number of downloads of OpenSUSE Leap skyrocketed to around 360k. In yeah, February. and it stayed consistent all the way up until last month too. From what I'm seeing, uh, let's see if we go to metrics.opensuSA.org, uh, we can see that, that's that way more than zero Linux. On February 27th, 360,000 downloads. So, yeah, it, it's insane. Like that the uh, People are actually downloading open systems now. But how many, but how many that, of them are sticking to it? Yeah, that it doesn't say that anything, you know. No. But <laughs> but you know, if you guys have never checked out open Sousa, I actually recommend that it's worth you know a look because open Sousa actually has a, a very unique approach to like doing things, and uh, their installer is something else. But to, but you know, after you after you take the time to actually figure it out, you actually realize that their installer is actually pretty cool if you actually dig into if it. you have patience to wait like i did when i installed open open susa leap for the first time uh yes it took me six hours to install it yes it took me six hours to install the entire it is back slow. then we had a little bit more power so it took six hours to install yes but oh, it also boy. pulls down so much stuff 
when it's installed. And small yeah. packages, because the packages, it's not like pulling a package and then extracting and installing the package. No, it's downloading and extracting at the same time. Yes. Yep. Yes. And like it, <laughs> that's the one thing that people normally complain about when it comes to OpenSUSE is when you install it, it pulls down way too much stuff. But at the same at the same time, you won't have to do that in the future. Yeah, so. that and you know, if you actually read the output of like uh, the zipper command in, in the terminal, which I know that the, there is no reason to use a terminal in OpenSUSE because Yast is a thing. But uh, yeah. if you actually take the time to actually read the output, it's actually really wordy and it tells you exactly what's going on too. Which yeah. which is actually but, a thing yeah, that a isn't lot Yast of... uh, the Octopi <laughs> look alike. Uh, Octopi is actually influenced by Yast, but they're yeah, very so different they projects. They look alike. They look similar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that said, uh, it, it's one of those distributions where it's just like, before you like, you actually look at like all the distro reviews that like talk, talk about it. And honestly, like just give, give it a shot if you haven't given it a shot because they uh, have a rock band. Have. Like you I should have, give it I a shot. Like they yeah, actually oh, have a band. And it's yeah, they actually bad. have a it's band. Good. You, you can go to Sousa's YouTube channel. You can watch them make parody music videos because you know they actually know how to do advertising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. don't ever, don't, don't. I had people call call Open Sousa, Open Sus. Yeah, they 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 yeah. gave me a band aid package because you know I I cut my finger while I was at Ohio Linux Fest and and uh, they had like first aid kits. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Suza. It's open Suza. Not open Suzy. Yeah, open there, there's a video about how to t how to pronounce Susa. Yeah. And you're <laughs> the one who sent it. <laughs> yep. And it's and it's also not it it's not as um or not it's not it's not like uh, the FSF telling you how to pronounce stuff. It's not in a very, you know, denigrating way. So no, it's, actually... it's, a, it's a hilarious. <laughs> I like, I like actually, the video, though. That, I like the video. Bad. Anyways, what? It's not always going to be slow. Zipper is actually sort of like DNF, where it will actually self-optimize after after uh, you use it for some time, and it actually does get pretty snappy. Just remember that, unlike DNF and everything else, Zipper is entirely in Python from from top to bottom on the stack. So of course it's good, and because of the way that it actually uh, do downloads and extracts packages, it does take wa longer to install a package on SUSE compared to like uh, a package manager you're more familiar with being like after Pacman, which will download the compressed binary, uncompress it, and then install it on your system. Mm -hmm. yep. It's, but uh, the way the main reason why they do it this way is because all of their packages are downloaded and installed transactionally. Basically more like it's much closer to like a git pull than, than it is an actual extraction and just replacing binary. All right. Well, uh, so I guess uh, my article is the last one, which is good. I told you guys we'd come back to gaming at some point. All right. Um, my article is about the Steam Deck now lets you transfer your games over your uh, from your PC. If we only knew how. <laughs> well, um, supposedly it's not that difficult. Um, I believe somewhere in this article it talks about um, how to do it. Um, and it's like essentially really all they've done is they've tried to make it. This update should make transferring your games easier as long as your, you know, Steam versions up to date and everything. I don't I don't think you have it's to be a on the beta. Called local game transfers, which allow Steam users to transfer existing Steam games from one PC to another PC to the Steam Deck over the local area network. Doesn't it actually say. tell you where the option is? Well, <laughs> hold on. The desktop mode uh, received several changes, blah, blah. Uh, a new U UI for account selection, blah, blah. And a new UI that temporarily replaces the what's new section in the library when pre-purchased games are available to preload and install and play. Um, so there's been a whole bunch of UI changes. And I'm going to assume, because up here it's got it um, transferring game files in your... Um, well, I will say I, will, I I experienced it. Uh, number one, there is one other change. I don't know what the, if, if it's mentioned in the article or not. I didn't read the article. But uh, the uh, 
you can download boot animations from the settings now. You don't need to have a custom boot, uh, uh, custom CSS loader. Uh, but uh, as to how to do it, they don't mention in the art article. Yeah. So uh, we need to figure that out on our own, <laughs> I yes. guess, or Google for it. I would definitely Google for it, but I'm also going to assume it's most likely going to be under uh, properties in Steam. Let me see. Do I have Steam open? I do. So I'm going to assume it's probably going to be um, somewhere in properties, uh, maybe in manage. But I, I don't want to test it because I want I God of War to be on the deck. Um, let's see. Uh, local files. No, there's no transfer button there. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. I think out. what you do is uh, right next to the play button, there's that little down arrow. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, uh, let's go back uh, up here. Might not be on Zomboid, but like on other games. Uh, well, Project so, Zomboid, I believe, is the only one I got installed right now. <laughs> yeah, but if you have another game installed, you'll have like a little drop. You'll have a green drop down arrow right next to that play button it, where you could probably just select that and you can tell it to. And uh, that does show up all other devices that you would be logged into Steam on. I bet you that button probably appears when my Steam Deck is on and connected to the network. I bet you. I, I bet you that would show up. Not sure, but you know, just throwing shit. One at the second. Wall. I am in my library. Uh, okay. I, 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 I love, I love how we're trying to test this out live. I have to. I have to configure Debian on this laptop to uh, enable. Uh, package repositories for uh, 32 bit. So give me just a second here. Pseudo D okay. package at architecture i386. Someone in chat said uh, there's a support page for it that says how, and I'm sure there is. There uh, probably is because you know it's Steam. Yeah, and we can also. Uh, I'm I'm going through the uh, client update. Uh, local network. Yep. Here we go. Uh, so active local game page, how it works before you start download uh, or update a game on Steam. Steam will first check if there's a, if there are other PCs running the Steam uh, running Steam on your LAN that could transfer it to directly. Uh, if a potential PC is found, your client will ask the Steam backend server to contact the other PC's Steam client and start a game file transfer if the local network transfers are enabled and possible. If the game, yeah, so it's got a full guide here. I'll go ahead and I'll just I'll just post this in uh, our chat, just in case anyone wants that. It'll be there in chat, and yeah. So we've covered all of the articles and stuff, and we're below an hour and thirty, which is wild. Um, did not expect that. So let's go well, ahead. You know, we didn't have Matt to uh, sit there and complain about the like some KDE application for the KDE article. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> that is true. But hey, I mean, we still went all off the wagon talking about Gaben and stuff and we were fine. Very surprised. So I guess we'll go ahead and talk about our thingies of the week and uh, we'll wrap up with, I guess, saying um, I'm sure that there's going to be a few Project Zomboid streams at some point uh, here in the next like little bit. So if anyone wants to catch those, you can. I'll probably be streaming it uh, as long as my family doesn't demand board game time today. Fingers crossed. No. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll go off with uh, my thingy of the week. Then we'll go Steve and Josh. We'll go counterclockwise. Yeah. All right. So uh, mine will be uh, Pantheon. Uh, I'm kind of really enjoying the desktop environment. I like it. It's definitely not for everybody, but uh, if you want something that's polished and just looks good out of the gate and has a simple light and dark mode with accent theming, you're if that's all the customization you want, you're probably going to really enjoy it. Uh, it's nice. It's a nice desktop environment. And uh, yeah, so on to you, Steve. What's your thingy of the week? My thingy of the week. Sorry, I'm uh, trying to download uh, God of War on the Steam Deck, see if it's going to copy it, but it doesn't seem like it's doing it. So it's downloading through internet. <laughs> so anyway, my thingy of the week is Amethyst. And uh, hold on to your horses, boys and girls. We're going to have us a little uh, session of, cr uh, of laughter. Uh, because if you pull up, uh, 
let's say my uh, you go to my forums if you can uh i'll send you i'll send you the link via dm Five. you have to show the screenshot you have to uh i went through a lot to, to just, i ran it on my system to do that so uh where are you zany i'm gonna send it to you okay if you there can it pull it up um and the first screenshot and show the first screenshot and i'm gonna read it because that's gonna put a la uh, a smile on everybody's face successful we upweighted weepo packages who you i don't know how you pronounce this could not find the remote packages for wib 32 wib web <laughs> <laughs> well, so, wham! You have an installed. Yes. So, has installed. A it's dot. got. It's an AUR helper for the people who don't know what it is. It's an. It's another yet another AUR helper, but this one's got a personality you can turn on or off. It's called the ooh, ooh personality. <laughs> and for <laughs> people who don't know what ooh personality, just uh, go on YouTube and search for O W O. What's this? This video is amazing. It, it, it she reads a whole article in uwu mode. It cracked me up. I couldn't understand a thing from the output in terminal because this thing replaces the Ls, the Rs, and almost everything with a W. So it's gonna be very hard to read. No upgrades available for install AUO packages. Yes, it gives. <laughs> it essentially gives your desktop. A lisp, which is yeah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it appears that at least one program you have installed, <laughs> upgraded, has installed a pack new config. Pew. These are created when you have modified programs configurations and package upgrade <laughs> i'm like okay <laughs> you want to enjoy your system install that and enjoy because it 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 it, it replaces pac-man and aur it's one command for both it's like running paru or yay basically uh and it runs with the same flags you ha you can it has a config file where you can turn on or off this Ooh, ooh, personality. It's it's better done by women because let's be honest, uh, it's not for men to be <laughs> to be like that. But it's got a lot of a few settings, not a lot. But you you have to do it via configuration file. But this personality thing, this twist, just got me rolling on the floor mm -hmm. from laughter because I couldn't read for the life of me what's going on, and and and. There's only one caveat to it. I don't know how to get rid of it. I even messaged the, the, the developer. I don't know if he got my message, but if he can get rid of this ever, because naturally in Arch, Pac-Man creates a backup called pack.packnew. It adds pack new. Every time you run Amethyst, it asks you, do you, wanna, do you want me to show you pack diff between the old and the new? I'm like, stop with that. This is what Arch does naturally. So every time I want to update my system, I need to see that and answer no. There's no way to turn it off. So, but other than that, it's hilarious. It, uh, but it gets old really fast, uh, like everything these days. Uh, but for a while, run it. I recommend everyone to run it for a little while. If they, if they were, they went, uh, they had a bad day, and they want to relax on their computer and have a uh, have a laugh and forget all the hardships that happened throughout that day or difficulties, just look at the terminal output while, while enabling the uwu mode. And dude, I promise you, you, you're gonna forget everything bad that happened throughout that day. It's so good. That's a good it's advertisement like, for it. Just whisk yeah, away your well, day's problems. Yeah, it's, yeah, it solves the, the, the day's problem. It doesn't solve them. It just makes you forget them for a short period of time. And like I said earlier, it will get old with time, so it's not something you're going to be using for, like, ever. Uh, it's something you're going to use for a short period of time, but do use it for that short period of time, because it's it's super funny. 
it's super funny. I it's it's something to use. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Josh, <laughs> what about your thingy of the week? Uh, my thing is not nearly as fun, but it's I would actually argue that it's actually more useful. It's called Junction. It's an application chooser. So basically, base and it's. No, very gnome specific, of course. But anyways, uh, say that you install like your favorite text editor, like VS Code, that sets itself as the default for literally everything from opening files and everything. Well, what this application does is every time you try to open up a file or you know click a link that's going to try to open up like a web page or something, it's going to pop pull up a menu that will actually display all of your different web browsers. So that way, you know, you're not always accidentally opening things in Firefox when you actually mean to be opening them up in Chrome. Uh, instead, it'll just give you an option to pick from. It's like, do, where do you want to open this? And it will actually persist afterwards. So that way, if you would click that same link or open up that same program in the future, it will just automatically default to what you previously picked. And uh, nice. you can... Yeah, and you can pull up the app, the Junction application itself, and you can actually reset these permissions as well. It's actually one of those programs that, like, if you use GNOME, it's prob it's actually probably not a bad idea to have this installed because you know GNOME and uh, default applications can be a little tricky sometimes. No, yeah, and I'm sorry, boys. Everyone who's been listening to the stream have been hearing my. Uh... Uh, elementary OS notifications. Sorry, I just turned on Do Not Disturb. Didn't realize. There's probably been like four throughout this entire stream. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> but yeah, so this looks neat. I, I, I like that. That is... I'm surprised that GNOME doesn't just have this already. It does, and it doesn't. It's actually real really stupid how gnome does it because uh, what you have to do is you actually have to right click and select the open with dialogue in gnome no this is this this just seems better over like they should just they should just integrate this into gnome uh, but this is one of those implementations gnome. a lot like uh gradients where it's just like uh you know gradients should ship with gnome now too <laughs> yeah <laughs> expecting gnome to integrate you know reasonable things that you know almost like every user would benefit from no no Give them six years, then they'll do it. <laughs> but all right, I, I, we have actually successfully done the podcast. Uh, that's wild. So, yeah, um, I guess we'll go ahead and close it off here. Uh, thank everyone for thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, thanks to all of Matt's patrons who make these these streams possible. Um, I would throw up a screen for it, but I. I could have asked Matt for that, but I didn't think about it. Um, it was a mad dash getting set up because I definitely didn't sleep for 12 hours straight before this podcast. It de definitely was not a thing. But yeah, so thanks everyone for being here. Uh, don't forget to go over and check out you know Matt's website and his channel uh, if you're not, for whatever reason, already subscribed to him. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I think we're going to end it off here. Uh, thanks everyone for All being right. here.